This is the Bethany Bible Church channel. I'm Pastor Ron Vandermeer with a message today entitled, What Do You Think About the Christ? Whose Son Is He? Open your Bibles to Matthew 22, verses 41 to 46, and also Psalm 110. Have a finger there as well. We'll be looking at that passage today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, may your wisdom fall upon us as we hear the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Speak to us regarding his own nature. This is so vital to our salvation, the subject of the deity of Christ, and we thank you for it and for how it fits all in to the great plan of redemption. Bless us today as we study your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When thinking about the Bible as a whole, we have so many passages that prove the deity of Christ. Jesus and the apostles labored diligently to prove that Christ is God in the flesh to the unbelieving Jews and Gentiles of that day. We today use these same verses to defeat the cults that universally deny the deity of Christ as well as those in these mainline denominations that see Jesus as nothing more than a martyr or a great teacher who had followers that made up stories about him to establish their own religion and keep that memory of Jesus alive. Well, no, when we look at the Bible we see a much different picture. Let's consider, and you see it on your screen right now, uh, a few of the key arguments for the deity of Christ. First, Jesus himself claimed to be God. So many references to that. John 11 is primary, John 4, and uh, several in Matthew. Second, why were the Jews so angry with Jesus? Well, the answer comes from John 10, 30 to 38, where they were taking up stones because Jesus claimed to be God. That's why they were angry. They didn't mind him healing people. They didn't mind him speaking out. It was the fact that he claimed to be God. Third, Isaiah 7:14 which is repeated in Matthew 1, verse 23, clearly state that it is through the virgin birth that God, that's Emmanuel, God with us, enters human history. Fourth, the prophetic names given in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, prove that the Messiah would have the very qualities reserved solely for God himself such as the mighty God and the everlasting Father. Fifth, Jesus repeatedly employed the special name of God, I am, in reference to himself. And, of course, if you look at Exodus 3.14, where Moses asked God what is his name, the answer was, I am that I am. Sixth, there is an eternal timetable for Christ to appear on the earth. Daniel 9, 24 to 27 succinctly states this timetable. Galatians 4, 4 refers to this being the fullness of the time. And even in Micah 5, 2, we find the name of the village where the Messiah would be born. And he's called there the everlasting. All that speaks of the deity of Christ. And today we study perhaps the greatest verse in the Psalms, Psalm 110.1. It's David's prophecy regarding his descendant who would be the Messiah. And so Jesus in the New Testament is going to refer to this verse and ask them, 
What do you think about the Christ whose son is he? So Jesus asks, and that's our first thought, whose son is he? When he asked the Pharisees that, he was speaking of these prophecies of the Christ, some of which we just mentioned. By the way, the Christ is Greek for the Messiah, the, the anointed one. He's also called the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15, the son of Abraham in Genesis 12.3. Moses called him that prophet in Deuteronomy 18.15, meaning the final word of prophecy coming from this one, the Messiah. And, of course, David is told that the Messiah would be the son of David, and that's in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13. Jesus wasn't asking for their opinion about who he was. He was being very specific. And by giving that question, he put the Pharisees on the horns of a dilemma. If they speak what the scriptures say about the Messiah, then they have to rightly say that he is the flesh and blood human offspring of the great King David. But if they think of him only as a man, they can't explain what David, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would say in Psalm 110 about his descendant. So Jesus forces us also today to choose just who we think he is. When we consider the scriptures, whose son is he? Secondly, we have the challenges found in King David's testimony. Listen to verses 43 and 44 of Matthew 22. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus goes on to ask, How does David in the Spirit call him Lord? And he quoted, of course, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Jewish leaders would have all recognized that that verse is a reference to to the Messiah. It was written by King David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and David looks ahead and expresses worship toward God for the promise of the Messiah that would one day be born from his own line. Do you notice, though, in that Hebrew uh, Old Testament that uh, the word Lord, the first time it's mentioned, is capitalized. Now, our translators want us to know that when it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, it's a reference to the sacred name of God in the Hebrew Scriptures, and Jewish people did not attempt to pronounce that. Uh, we just say it's the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, uh, would be the uh, four letters that are there. And it's a word that speaks of the covenant name of the Almighty God of Israel. But then notice, if you're reading along, that it also has a second time, and it says, Lord, but it's not in all caps. And that's the translator's way of letting us know that this second Lord is the word Adonai. And it just means Lord or Master. So we have two different words, both translated Lord, but they're different, and the difference is significant. Now, all these Pharisees and scribes understood that David is speaking of the Messiah. We mentioned that. But Jesus asked them, if David is speaking of his promised offspring, whom we all rightly know to be the Messiah, then how is it that he also, in prayer, before 
Lord, Y-H-W-H, all caps, calls his own son Adonai, Lord, without caps. Everyone recognizes that a father is always to be honored as the superior of his son, and everyone recognizes that the great King David, the greatest king of, of all earthly kings of God's covenant people, how can he refer to a descendant not yet born as being his Lord? David, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saw that the Messiah is both God and man. He's David's Lord, and he's our Lord as well. Well, that is our third thought. The Messiah must be God and man. Look at verses 45 and 46 of Matthew 22. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. These religious leaders who were debating Jesus expect, expected a strictly human Messiah to arise from the lineage of King David and to be a mighty, conquering human king in their own day. But Jesus, though fully human, had been presenting himself to them as more than a mere man, doing miracles, healing people, raising people from the dead. Jesus is forcing them to the conclusion that the Messiah is both God and man. So he says, if David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? If the Messiah is the human descendant of King David, as all agree, then how could David say such a thing about him? They needed to look carefully at what these words of David, spoken again, as we mentioned before, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how could it be that he's his Lord? It requires that the Messiah has to be a pre-existent person, someone that David sees as alive right then. And yet he's a thousand years before Jesus is born. The Pharisees couldn't get around this one. The Lord said to my Lord. Accordingly, these words require that the Messiah be understood as a divine person. Here we see God speaking to another person in a way that he spoke to no mere man. When David repeats the words of God himself, sit at my right hand, he's using a term that would be used by a mighty ruler who is extending the greatest possible honor and exaltation, which means that he's sharing his own glory with that one. Now, God the Father would never speak of that to any mere man. Isaiah says, specifically, verse 8 of Isaiah 42, and then it gets repeated in Isaiah 48, verse 11, that God will not give his glory to another. It's impossible. You remember before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed, and now, Father, Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. That's John 17, verse 5. That makes it so plain. Jesus is God. Jesus had glory, and David saw the Father 
sharing his glory with the Son. A thousand years before the Son walked the face of the earth. This would have been extremely disturbing to those who opposed Jesus as being the Messiah, and especially Jesus as being God in the flesh. But yet it's cited by Jesus to prove that he is the Messiah, and he will be the judge. Again, let me repeat that verse. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus would say later in Matthew 25, 31 and 32, these words, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Hmm. If we take David's words to be the words given him by God the Holy Spirit, if we look at the works that Jesus performed and hear the words that he spoke, we're forced to only one conclusion. The only way that David could speak to his own human offspring, calling him Lord, would be if his offspring was also God in the flesh. He has to be both human and divine. It can't be any other way. Just a few days from this time when uh, Jesus was saying these words, the religious leaders would indeed start to decide they must kill this one. He has defeated them, but they will supposedly defeat him by having him executed. Matthew finished this passage in verse 46 of uh, his book and chapter 22. No one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare to question him anymore. They found they couldn't answer him. All they could do was put him to death. And that's exactly what they did. But three days later, he rose from the dead. Praise God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you so much for this great psalm, 110, called the greatest psalm because it nails down forever the fact that your plan of salvation includes sending the second person of the Trinity to this earth to become a man, both God and man in one, Emmanuel, God with us, to bring us redemption, which we could never achieve in our own fallible uh, beings. But we know you knew that and you planned that, and you brought us salvation. We thank you for the gift of grace provided by our Savior on the cross. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you all.